Notre Dame, Heisman Trophy finalist, now part of a Fox kickoff on Saturday's Brady Quinn, smart guy, uh, is joining us, Fox Sports College football analyst. So we got a lot to talk about. First of all, I want to do a Notre Dame question before we get to the biggest game of the weekend. I'm a fan of Brian Kelly. I think the optics sometimes, Brady, are not good. His face is orange. He's screaming. <laughs> optics matter in life. I think sometimes, I mean, if you go to his Wikipedia page, there's a picture of him with his Notre Dame hat on. He looks freezing, unshaven, and I'm like, somebody's got to get him a new Wikipedia picture. <laughs> but I will tell you something. They adjust, and you know this. NFL teams are pretty good at adjusting, half to yeah. half. Yeah. College football, it is a coin flip. Notre Dame in that first quarter against Louisville was lost. By the third quarter, they had completely figured it out. When I watch Brian's teams, I see a well-coached, often adjusting organization. Um, do you Have you always been a fan? Has he gotten better? How does it land for you? No, I've always been a fan from him just from my interactions with him. But I think as I've started to pay more attention to, even over the years, the changes he's made to change with the times and remain competitive – it's what stood out to me. I mean, the fact that, you know, he at one point really wanted to take his hands off of things. And I think when he hired Mike Elko, who's now the defensive coordinator at Texas A&M, he brought in Chip Long as his offensive coordinator. You could kind of tell, like, at that point in time, he really took his hands off and he was just going to manage everything. And I think that's where you've seen him even calm down to some degree, no much question. more on the sidelines. Tom Coughlin did that in his NFL career. He, he gave more away and came off the ledge a little. And, and, and I think – to be able to change this late in his career, this old in life, just tells you he's still growing. He's still improving as a head coach. And I think there's something to be said for that. It's, it's hard to do that. It's not you know, human nature to be able to make those changes. Usually you've built in those habits, and it's hard for you to get away from things that you may feel uncomfortable about. You know, taking your hands off of some of the offensive play calling or defensive play calling. And, and I'm sure he chimes in from here, you know, time to time. But he's managing the team now, and now he's got the ability – to watch what's happening out there on both sides of the ball or in all three phases and say, these are the changes that we need to make, or here's what I'm seeing. And then the coach can get together and come back with whatever their response is. And I think that was, that was pretty evident Monday night watching them in their opener versus Louisville. Uh, Lincoln Riley is a really smart guy, and he's taken now three transfers. And I didn't know much about Baker Mayfield. Great. Uh, I, I follow recruiting, so I knew Kyler Murray transferred. Great. Uh, and then Jalen Hurts, I watched at Alabama and thought he was a liability throwing the ball. And then I watch him and I think, all right, what? Where's the wizard coming from? Um, what is the secret sauce? Is it the communication, the schematics? This is uncommon where you take three transfers. Right. You don't even know the odometer, and they're all instantly pow. What's the secret sauce for Lincoln Riley? Well, it's, it starts with Lincoln, right? I mean, he's had a prolific offense dating back to his days at ECU and before yes. he even became the head coach. So it's in part the system. I think it helps you play in a conference in the Big 12 that, let's be honest, the, the defense isn't that good in comparison to the rest of the Power 5 conferences. And then you talk about elite talent at the quarterback position, right? Baker Mayfield is one of the most accurate quarterbacks I'd ever seen college or NFL level. Kyler Murray had the same ability to make special throws, but also hurt you with his legs. And now you've got a, a different type of quarterback who is very capable of throwing the football, but probably just as much, uh, just as, if not more so capable running and making plays with his legs. And so I think the thing that stands out to me is besides the talent that he's had, it's also been the fact that he's been willing to be flexible and creative with how he changes his scheme to fit the strengths of each one of his quarterbacks. And that's usually the sign of, of a good coach where sometimes other coaches will say, this is my system. If you can't run this set of plays or this base package or whatever I feel comfortable with, I got to find a guy who can, because I don't want to have to adapt or adjust. I, I'm, I'm going to run what I know. I, I, I don't want to spend the time to go out and try to do something else that I haven't done before or figure out how to make you work in a, in a system that I'm not comfortable with calling. So uh, I think that's been something that's kind of flown under the radar is his flexibility to be able to make whatever his system is work for whatever quarterback uh, and, and his traits or skill set is. You know, it's funny. Um, Harbaugh is, is such a polarizing figure. I think he has his best offensive personnel. Um, I always saw Urban Meyer as more of a CEO. Uh, it's about the unit. Jim, to me, is more Elon Musk. He's more of the individual entrepreneur lead by my chin, he would be the small business owner that gets rich. Right. You know, you can't really manage Jim. Jim is his own entrepreneur. Uh, if Jim Harbaugh doesn't win the conference this year without Urban Meyer in it, 
is it now fair? Because I've been a Harbaugh proponent. Is it fair to criticize him? Is it fair to say you you have underachieved at Michigan? Well, I, I think that story isn't done yet. Okay. I, think, I think it's fair to give him criticism, right? Because everyone's looking at their team now and looking at the fact that this transition out of Ohio State from Urban Meyer to Ryan Day, like if you don't do it now, when, right? And, and that's fair. So it's, it's fair to criticize. But I also think that he's probably the most underappreciated coach in college football. When you look at really what he's done since he's got there, right? The seven years prior to Jim Harbaugh, they're averaging six and a half wins a year. They're averaging nine and a half now. I mean, you're and the Big about, Ten's better. And, and the Big Ten's gotten more competitive. And I think part of the reason why he's underappreciated is because, you know, around the time when Jim Harbaugh gets hired, Urban Meyer was hired. So you've got these big names now, right, that are entering the Big Ten. And, and look, growing up in Columbus, Ohio, you were always comparing Ohio State to Michigan and Michigan to Ohio State. That was what it was. You know, that was what it was forever. And I remember when John Cooper was there and he didn't beat Michigan enough. He didn't win enough bowl games. And eventually that was his demise, even though he had some good football teams. Oh, he had some very good teams. But again, you got to beat the team up north and you got to win more bowl games. And so Jim Trestle came in and he did that. But the unfair part, I think, for Harbaugh and this whole comparison between the two is, you know, Jim Harbaugh took over a program that was in an entirely different circumstance than what Urban Meyer took over. I mean, look at the success that Jim Trestle had. He won a national championship after that 2002 season recruiting versus Miami. Was, recruiting was great. Recruiting was great. He went to back-to-back -back national championship games. Urban beat them in 2006 or after that season. In 2007, they won again, lost to LSU. But they were still right there. I mean, the, the, the cliff that Michigan fell off of through the Rich Rod to Brady Hoke years was significant. You had seven years where they just weren't really competitive, at least not consistently. Yeah. And now he's br brought them to a point where nine and a half is the standard. They're probably playing in a New Year's Six game pretty much every year. And then this year, I think, could very well be the year that they compete, not only for to win the Big Ten, but ended up making a run for the college football playoff. And look, national exposure. He came up with the idea to take them, you know, these kids over to, to Europe and let them travel and all that. And He's you know, made Michigan matter. He, he has. He's brought Michigan, one of the blue bloods in college football, back to the forefront. And that's something that I think has been underappreciated in all of this just because he hasn't beaten Ohio State and because he hasn't won enough bowl games. Brady Quinn joining us. Of course, the big noon kickoff for Fox Sports. Uh, Urban Meyer, Reggie Bush, Matt Leinart, Brady, Rob Stone. Um, Rob Stone, by the way, the only human on the air that never <laughs> ages. He's 74 He's and Benjamin still. Benjamin Button. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, okay, Texas LSU. I watched Texas beat Georgia last year and physically push him around. But I say to myself, that game meant more to Texas than Georgia. My gut feeling is Texas is a year away in recruiting to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with LSU. But Tom Herman's been a great underdog coach. Mm -hmm. Like, last 15 games as an underdog, like, just as a betting guy, like, they've covered 13, they've won most. Oh, yeah. So my gut feeling is Texas takes this to the last possession, but I don't think Texas is quite there yet. Is that fair? I think that's fair. You know, when Sam Ellinger announced after the bowl game that Texas is back – you know, it's, it's, easier to, it's easy to say that after that particular win, That's right? That's right. Now is the time where you need to prove that you're back because it's not just about winning the Big 12 because I do think they're back in contention for the Big 12. They yes. very well could win it this year. Yes. But it's national contention. That's where people are talking about, are they back? Are they back to the Vince Young kind of era, Colt McCoy, where they were competitive and they were close? You know, so, so this is a time now where I'm saying, if you think you're back, you've got to win this game. And I think it, the odds are obviously against them. If, if I was a gaming man, right, yeah. I, I might take the points. Right. Right. But but at the same time, I think if you look at the changes that Orgeron has made, bringing in Joe Brady. Yes. To me, that's going to be the difference in this one. I, I agree, too. Finally, weird story. Uh, Kyler Murray had an interview with Dan Patrick. Dan's a very good interviewer. It was awful. He didn't <laughs> talk. Uh, there's a story that came out this week uh, 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 where C Cliff Kingsbury said you have to pull words out of him. And I said, all quarterbacks in the NFL that work have one thing in common. Not all of them have a great arm. Not all move. Eli's not an athlete. Um, they're all verbal. That's why most of you guys end up on TV. You got to communicate to your tackle, to your guard, the tight end that you didn't throw to enough. You got to tell them, <laughs> I love you, big fella. Next week, the coverage is different. I hear that story on Kyler Murray, NFL, and I think, oh, no, this is the Mariota problem, where Marcus is not a verbal person, and quarterback's a verbal, you're a very verbal person. Can you, can you win in the NFL not being verbal? No, you can't. But let's also remind ourselves, Kyler Murray played one year, one year of major college football. Okay. Sort of one year. Okay. So when you look at him, he's still got a lot of maturing and growing to do in that regard. 
And even Dwayne Haskins last year, when I remember going to see him early in the season before he called, called a ball game, and then later on in the year, that was what the coaches were telling you is he's not verbal enough. He's not speaking up when we feel like something needs to be said. Sure. By the end of the year, he was starting to do that. So maybe that's a little bit of the case with Kyler Murray. Um, but also you have to think about the offenses that they're running now. You know, it, it, like back in the old days when you actually huddled, <laughs> you know, you were having someone either signal in the play and you're telling everyone what the play is. You're communicating to each individual guy that's an eligible receiver what their route is, what you're expecting from them. So naturally, before the, the play even starts, you're already communicating and working on that with them. That was part of the part of the job. Now these guys in college, they just look to the sidelines. They get a signal. Guys are signaling elsewhere to the receivers and maybe the linemen. And, and that's how they're, they're moving forward with the way they're playing the game. So I think that kind of plays a role, too, because it's, it's not. They don't necessarily have to anymore to be successful at the college level to, to communicate at that level like they need to at the NFL level. So I think that's something that can grow over time and probably will for Kyler Murray as he gets more experience. Okay, it's called the Big Noon Kickoff. Uh, Brady's on it. Urban Meyer, Reggie Bush, Matt Leinert, Rob Stone. 11 a.m. in the morning. Another weekend of college football. Some good games. By the way, UCLA and Chip Kelly will win this weekend. That's my pick. <laughs> That didn't work out last week, did They it? played 22 games against San Diego State. They've never lost. I'm going with UCLA this weekend. It's great having you on the show. Love to have you back. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.